Let's now get to our last subject called leadership. We'll take about another 30 minutes here, cover some on leadership, and then we'll take our last short 10 minute break and then we'll come back and finish up the day finishing up leadership. The title of the weekend was called The Making of a Leader. And it takes a lot of things really for the skill of leadership. All the things we've talked about, the personal development side and setting goals, being able to make plans, game plans, time management, communication, all of that is all part of the preparation and the continuing schooling and education of leadership. But now we're going to cover the subject per se, leadership. And I've got an interesting uh, phrase to start with under leadership, and it goes like this. To attract other people, you must be attractive. And we've covered that, sort of sprinkled throughout the last couple of days. What you want, you attract. So to attract other people, you must be attractive. So a big part of the process of leadership is self-development, not people development, but self-development. Leadership, the great challenge of the 80s, I call it, in all kinds of fields, science, politics, industry, education, sales. We do need some leadership in the sales field. We're still hearing some of the old cliches of the 30s, right? roll the pencil across the table and before it drops, they'll grab it and you ask them to sign. I mean, you know, we don't need those <laughs> tricky things anymore. <laughs> People are a lot more sophisticated. They're a lot brighter these days, right? The old sales tricks won't work, you know. True sales is an educational process. Let me tell you what I've got and how it works. See if you like it. And if I'm good at it, I'm sure you'll buy. If I'm not, I'm not sure. But let me try. Just honesty and sincerity and upfront and leveling with everybody. I'll tell you what's hard for other people to handle. Total sincerity and honesty. I mean, what do you do with that? I mean, tricks, you can learn to be tricky. If somebody wants to spar, you can learn to spar. If somebody wants to dance and dodge, you can learn to dance and dodge. But what do you do with total honesty and total sincerity? See, that's hard. Schof said in the sales field at first, he said, just go out and be just totally sincere. So I did it. In those early days, somebody say, why, why should I buy from you? I says, because I need the sale. <laughs> if I don't sell something soon, I'm in deep trouble. I couldn't believe what that disclosure would do for some people. Try total honesty, and that was total honest. If you don't buy, I'm in trouble. The guy says, well, okay, I'll buy, right? I mean, I couldn't believe it. If you got to, sell with tears in your eyes. See, I tell you why I'm troubled right now. I'm new at this, and I'm afraid if I don't tell it right, you won't buy, and you'll miss the opportunity. I wish this was a year from now, I know you'd buy, but let me try my best. See, just honesty. What can somebody do with just honesty? After I'd make a sale, or try to make a sale, guy says, no, I'm really not interested. I'd say, look, I know now you're not gonna buy, but would you give me some tips? I'm brand new at this sale. Would you give me some tips as to why you didn't buy? Is it because I'm new and I stumbled a little bit? because I know you need the product. Did you not buy because I wasn't strong enough? Those are interesting questions, aren't they? That's called, let's get right down to it. Now see, I was so simple back then in my presentation, I'd just ask, how come you didn't buy? I know you need it. Is it because I'm new? Guy says, well, yeah, probably about a year from now when you get better, I would have bought. Said, Then I got, you know, a little better at saying, well, why don't you go ahead and buy? You know, let's pretend it's a year from now. <laughs> I don't know, just honesty. Just let it all hang out. Just tell it like it is. You just, 
being clever just isn't the, really the way to do it, just honesty. Anyway, we need some of that kind of leadership, instructions, helping people these days. Here's another challenge for leadership, parents. A lot of parents are hoping someone else will exercise the leadership role. Teachers or the church or the school or the community. Somebody will take up the task of being the example of leadership. But this is a challenge for parents to take up themselves, to become leaders. Here's the real challenge for leadership. Leadership is the challenge to be something more than mediocre. The challenge to be something more than mediocre. It was said of Abraham Lincoln, when his mother died, she, he was at her bedside when she died. And her last words to him were, be somebody, Abe. And if that story is true, he must have taken it to heart. <coughs> be somebody. That's a good challenge. Be somebody. Be somebody wise. Be somebody strong. Strength is attractive. Be somebody kind. All of the attributes of leadership are a unique challenge. Now here's the real key. Learn to be strong but not rude. There's always the thin line that you have to wa watch and make sure you don't cross. Learn to be strong but not rude. The challenge is to be kind but not weak. Learn to be bold but not a bully. The challenge is to be humble but not timid. Be thoughtful, but not lazy. Learn to be proud, but not arrogant. That's a challenge. Learn to have humor without folly. It's okay to, uh, you know, tell funny stories, but the key in leadership is don't be silly, right? There's a difference between being silly and, and having humor. Okay, that's the challenge of leadership. Now, leadership should understand the 20%, 80% rule. And the 20%, 80% rule, I don't know exactly where it came from, but if you're going to be involved with people any amount of time or any number of people from whatever walks of life, you've got to understand what we call the 20%, 80% rule. And if you haven't heard it before, let me give it to you. The 20%, 80% rule says, it seems like, and that's a lot of things, right? It seems like. 20% of the people do 80% of the business and 80% of the people do 20%. It's just one of those strange things about life. And we can ask whys all day long. A lot of things you don't ask why. Let the obvious be your best teacher. Almost any, per, any per enterprise, right? Whether it's a business or a club or whatever. Sure enough, 20% of the people do 80%, 80% do 20%. Ask the minister of the church, right? Who picks up the tab here? I'll bet you he will say, well, let's see, about 20% of the people pick up 80% of the tab. And 80% pick up 20%. It's just one of those interesting statistics about life, okay? Now, once you understand the 20%, 80% rule, here's what you must learn to do as a leader. Don't try to change it. This is not something you change. 
This is something you work with. See, there's a lot of things in life you don't change. You don't say, I think I'll take fall and put it after uh, winter. Say, no, no, no. See, that's too difficult. You don't change fall around and put it after winter. You leave it where it is. But you learn to work with it like it is. Okay? The best beginning for any successful venture is reality. Let's figure out how it really is and not kid ourselves and not wish it was different. Okay, so we take the 20%, 80% rule like it is and we learn to work with it. Now here's some of the key points in understanding the 20%, 80% rule. If you wish to affect your business 80%, you must work with the 20%. It's just one of those things you just learn to work with. To affect your business 80%, you work with the 20% that are creating 80% of the business. Now, let me give you a unique part of life. The pull is in the opposite direction. And it always is. Here's what success is. Success is learning to move in the opposite direction of the normal negative pull. Success is just overcoming the normal negative downward trend. Because I guess that's what life was meant to be, overcoming the normal negative downward pull. Success is moving in the opposite direction. Life that springs from the seed really is moving in the opposite direction. Gravity wants to pull the seed down, but sure enough, the seed being pulled down by the soil takes root, comes to life, right? Comes to life, takes root, starts to grow, and which way does it grow? Up, right? It gets the roots and the nourishment, but it grows up. It pushes its way against gravity, right? It moves up, and that's what success is. That's what life is of movement in the opposite direction. So, guess who wants 80% of your attention? The wrong percentage. The 80% of whatever enterprise you're working with, you got a group of people going, 80% of them want 80% of your time. They say, well, we're the 80%. But see, you've got to learn to resist that. Now, you do it diplomatically. You do it with intelligence. But if you want to be successful, you got to do it. Okay? You've got to give 80% of your time to the 20% and 20% of your time to the 80%. Somebody says, well, now how do you do that? Well, now here's where you got to get smart. Here's what I learned to do with the 20%, 80% rule. I learned to give the 20% individual time and the 80% group time. I just figured that out. Say, well, these 80% are only producing 20% of the business. So I've got to figure out a way to talk to them by groups. Now I can talk to an individual that's doing the high production, but I can only talk to the groups in these collection of people that are doing the small production. Okay? Now guess who wants your individual time? The wrong percentage. What you've got to do is just diplomatically move in the opposite direction. You just diplomatically learn how to just give the group time to the 80%, individual time to the 20%. Now, this is not something you fight. It's something you work with. Guy says, oh, I got it made. Here's what I will do. I'll just eliminate the 80%. Right? They're only getting 20% of the business anyway. I'll just get rid of them. And I'll just keep the 20%. Well, you can do that, but here's what will happen pretty soon. The people that you've got left after you have fired the 80%, sure enough, 20% of them will be doing 80% of the business. And 80% will be doing 20%. This is like the seasons. This is not something you try to rearrange. This is something you get smart enough to work with. Now, every leader must have some listening time to what's going on in the field, what's happening with the people. Here's what you must do with your listening time. You must give 80% of your listening time to the 
and 20% of your listening time to the 80%. Now guess who wants 80% of your listening time? The wrong percentage. So you just have to learn to be diplomatic, okay? It's incredible. This is something you learn to work with and not against. Now, what you do is just learn to capitalize on the way things are. To create the market, most people buy when it's high and sell when it's low. Right? That's normal. That's the normal scare. That's the normal being uneasy. Buy when it's high, sell when it's low. Guess who becomes wealthy? The people who move in the opposite direction. Now that takes tremendous strength of will and capacity and knowledge. And it doesn't mean you hit it every time, but it does mean your chances are much better to buy when it's low and sell when it's high. Right? That's what success is. Success is moving in the opposite of the normal negative downward pull. But what's unique about human enterprise is unique things can be accomplished by understanding the world setup, understanding how people are, and learning how to work with it and not against it. Now next, we'll cover this and then we'll take a little break. Leadership should understand the law of averages. One of the most important studies to study is the law of averages. And the reason is because everybody's affected by it. This side of the world, the other side of the world. Business is affected by it, social, personal, people, religious, doesn't matter what it is. We're all affected by the law of averages. The church is affected by it. The, the office is affected by it. The community is affected by it. The state's affected by it. The families, everybody's affected by the law of averages. So it's a good one to understand how it works, what's going on, so you're not disappointed and tipped over and upset. See, once you find out the truth, there's a Bible phrase that says, the truth sets you free. And it sets you free from animosity. It sets you free from being tipped over and bent out of shape. You just have to understand how it is. People used to cut me off on the freeway. I would go absolutely bonkers. I'm now chasing them down the freeway. See, I learned not to do that. Right? Because some things are just, uh, just frustration. They accomplish nothing. It's like saying, liar shouldn't lie. Now, see, that's called idle conversation. <laughs> right? There's no use even talking about that. Because, see, liars are going to lie. Now, you can say they shouldn't, but that won't help. Okay? Liars lie. Cheaters cheat. Thieves steal. And you can say they shouldn't, but that's called idle conversation. Understand how it is. Right? Some things are it's just, like, it's just like it is. Once you understand that that's how it is, see, now that takes you off the hook from being bent out of shape, disappointed, frustrated, angry, you don't understand, you're all confused. See, once you know, then it just takes away all the confusion and the misunderstanding and the misreading. Now when somebody cuts you off on the freeway, see, you just you learn to handle that better. To tell them they shouldn't, see, that won't help, right? Because they're always going to do that. You know, if those people who cut you off on the freeway really tip you over, then you're going to be tipped over the rest of your life because those people are always going to do that. They're known as cutter offers on the freeway. I mean, that's what they are. One of the best things is to take the simple approach. The guy says to me, well, this is happening to me, and this is happening to me, and this is happening to me. I do this and then this happens, and then this goes wrong and then this happens. How come all these things happen to me? I'm trying my best. I say, sir, I really don't know. The best experience I've got over the last 25 years especially is those kind of things always happen to people like you. <laughs> I don't know. That's the best I can figure out. What you've got to consider is, if you wish for it to change, you must consider that perhaps you should change. 
See, if this is happening to me, maybe it's because it's the person I am. Now, some things are accidents, I understand that. But some things are attracted. You've just got to make sure that it wasn't just accident, that maybe you're becoming that kind of cynical person. Maybe unhappiness is attracting unhappiness. Maybe over, overdue sadness is, is attracting sadness, right? Maybe confusion attracts confusion. And it's true, whatever we are attracts, so we must take a look and see where we are. But the law of averages is unique. And of course, the best place to study all the laws is in the Bible. Here's what the law of averages says. If you do something often enough, if you do something often enough, you will get a ratio of results. A ratio. And that's one of the key words in leadership to remember. Everything has ratios. Now, what do we mean by ratios? Well, it concerns anything. Let's say you just joined a new company and you're out selling some new product. And you talk to 10 people. You're just brand new. You talk to 10 people. Say, I got this neat product. And you present it to 10 people. Nine say no. And one says yes. Now, already you've got your ratio going. And we call it one out of 10. That's fairly simple, right? No matter what you do, if you do it continuously for a while, you'll get a ratio, some kind of ratio. Okay. In baseball, what do we call it? Batting. Batting average. See, if somebody's pitching, you're up there swinging, sure enough. Now, even if you're, you're an amateur, if you keep swinging, you'll, you'll get one, right? The ball will hit your bat, I mean, <laughs> right? You, you just get in the way, you know? You just do it often enough. But a ratio starts to develop, right? Now, here's an interesting question about the ratio. Who will this ratio work for? See, anybody can get a ratio started. That's a key word. Any one can work on this ratio. Now, you might say, well, if you're getting started and nine say no and one says yes, right? You're not doing that well. Well, let's see, at first you don't worry about doing well. At first you get a ratio going so that you can look at it and analyze it and see what's happening. That's why it's very important in sales we teach. Talk to lots of people every day, and at the end of the day, jot down your progress. This is why your journal is so important. At the end of the day, make a list of your progress. Here's what I did, and here's what happened. So that you can go back over it and start analyzing it. So you can see what to fix, and what to get on that's good, and what to get off that's bad. But anybody can get one of these ratios going. Now, even those that say no are valuable because at first they listen to you practice your presentation, right? And we teach in sales, you don't want to make a sale, you want to become a salesperson. So these people who say no, they're listening to you practice. In fact, at first you might want to pay them. <laughs> say, here's $5, just listen to my presentation. I'm not that good at it yet, you know, whatever, right? To get this whole thing started. Now, this will work for anybody, one out of 10. Now, see, uh, you can start to compete. Here's the next rule for the law of averages, the ratios. Once a ratio starts, it tends to continue. Once a ratio starts, it tends to continue. If you're just getting started, you talk to 10, nine say no, one says yes. Here's what's exciting. Chances excellent if you talk to 10 more, you get another one. It's uncanny. I don't even know how it works. All I know is it works. Sure enough, another one will say yes. And see now, all you got to do is just do this two or three times. Talk to 10 more, another one says yes. Now you know you're getting about one out of 10. And see now you can start to compete. And that's one of the next best incentives is competition. So get your ratios going so you can compete. Now, see, if I joined your company and I just got started and you're so good, you can get nine out of 10. And I just started and I can only get one out of 10 because I just got there. If we have a contest for 30 days on sales, I will win. So he says, how would you do that? See, it's very simple. 
since you're so good, you can get nine out of 10, and the contest goes 30 days, while you're talking to 10 and getting nine, I will talk to 100 and get 10. So that when the month is over, you've got nine, I've got 10. I win. <laughs> and that's one of my objectives, is to win. Now I have another objective, for you to lose. because you learn a great deal by losing. And I wish to be your teacher. <laughs> Competition, learning how to compete. What I do is make up for in numbers what I first lack in skill. Once you understand the law of averages, you can make up for in numbers what you first lack in skill. See, if I have to, I'll sleep three hours a day and work 21 or 20. I will to win. Now, I can't do that forever, but if we've got something going, see, I'll just make up for in numbers. If I don't have the skill, I will make it up in numbers, okay? Now you can start to compete, getting one out of 10. A ratio tends to continue. Now, who will it continue for? Anyone who tries, if you try, okay? Now, here's the next key on the law of averages for the ratios. The ratio can be increased. Isn't that unique? You talk to 10, get one. Talk to 10 more, get one. Talk to 10 more, you get another one. Talk to 10 more, you get two. Why is that? Why would about the fourth time you talk to 10, you get two instead of one? You're getting better. Key question, who can get better? Anyone who tries. See, that's exciting. Now, could you stay and work hard enough to get this ratio up to three or four out of 10? Is that possible? For who? Anyone. Could you stay long enough to be a pro, get six, seven out of 10? Is that possible? For who? Anyone. What's exciting to know is that capacity meeting opportunity can yield the most incredible results. And you have all the capacity that's necessary and you're surrounded by opportunity. I mean, you lack nothing from where you sit to create enterprise and wealth and fortune, and lifestyle, all the uniqueness you want being surrounded by opportunity and having unlimited capacity. I mean, what else would you ask for? Some people say, well, could you just bring it to me? Well, no, no. <laughs> okay, now there's a Bible story that teaches the law of averages. It's an interesting story called the parable of the sower, the parable of the sower, the story of the sower. And if you haven't read it for a while, it's an interesting, very interesting uh, story to read. It's a great illustration of the law of averages, the parable of the sower. The sower in the ancient days was the guy that planted the crops. They called him the sower, right? They got the ground ready. I don't know just how they all got it all ready, right? But they got the ground ready. And this guy called the sower was the planter of the crops. And he would take a bag of seed, walk across the field, and he would, right, sow the seed and plant the crops. They called him the sower. Now the story of the sower is a typical story of life and people and results and what you can expect, right? And then you let the obvious be your best teacher. Now when you read the story of the sower, you'll come up with some interesting, uh, some interesting points. First, the sower was a wise man. And when you read the whole story, you'll come to the conclusion, the sower was a wise man, which is a high advantage. Right? You don't want to send a dummy out to plant. Right? We will all starve come fall. Next point of the story was, the sower had excellent seed. Excellent seed. Story says he had the best. He didn't settle for something cheap and second best. 
third point of the story, he was highly ambitious. And when you read the whole story, you'll come to the conclusion this man was ambitious, which is an admirable quality, ambition. And then he went to work. Guy says, oh, I knew there was a hitch in there somewhere. That's where it is probably, right? The guy goes to work. Now the story with the sower, with the excellent seed, highly ambitious, opportunity all around him, he has the capacity, he's got the seed, everything's ready, and he starts out to sow to get some results. Now it's an interesting story about what happened to him. It's a typical story of life, but it's fascinating. Here's what it says. He starts out to sow the seed early in the morning, but the first part of the seed that he sows falls by the wayside and the birds get it. He's sowing this good seed, highly ambitious man, sowing this good seed and the birds are grabbing it. He sows some more and the birds grab that. He sows some more and the birds grab that. Now, remember this is a typical story of life and people. Now, is that fairly typical? See, I got to tell you as a leader, the birds are gonna get some of the seed. You get a hold of John. Let's say you're in real estate, right? Somebody here's in real estate. You get a hold of John. John says, hey, I'm looking for a change. I need a new uh, occupation change. And I've heard about real estate. You say, John, come on over Friday night. We're gonna have this orientation class and we'll show you how to do it. Might be the new life for you. Earn the money you want to earn. Get your life turned around. Who knows what'll happen? John says, sounds great to me. Uh, I'll be there on Friday night. Learn all about it. I'll probably be one of your best salesmen. Say, okay, see you Friday night. Now come Friday night, 7.30, supposed to start. John's not there. Hmm. Say, well, maybe the traffic's a little heavy. So uh, we wait till quarter to eight. About eight o'clock, we come to the conclusion. What? He's not gonna show. Question. What's happened since this unique conversation that you had with John and you dropped on him this great idea, you've got the explanation, helped to change his life. He said he would agree to be there and he's not there. What's probably happened between then and Friday night? The birds done got the boy. <laughs> got him. And who knows who the heck it might be, right? Maybe it's his brother-in-law, right? Says real estate, you're not gonna mix up in that, are you? talked him out of it. Or he's plumber. He says, let me tell you about real estate. He's plumber. Now, if you get the message back as to what happened, see, here's where you might get off track. There's a couple of things you can do when the birds are grabbing the seed. One is you can chase birds. See those dirty birds? And away you go after the birds. You say, wait till I get a hold of his brother-in-law. I'll straighten him out. Tear him a new page. What does he know about real estate? Is plumber... Now, see, you're off trying to straighten things out rather than accepting it as it is. The best study of life is how it is, not how you wish it to be, not how you wish to rearrange it, how to take advantage of how it is. Some people would rather get even than to get ahead. They get off course. See, if you're off chasing birds, you have left the field. You're not sowing anymore. Now your chances go down instead of up. There's some things you don't try to cure. There's some things you ignore. Here's what it said this wise sower did. It said he ignored the birds and he kept on sowing. How clever. There's some things you just got to accept. That's the way it is. So he keeps on sowing. And here's the key. If you keep sowing, you can sow more than the birds can get. But the birds are part of life. And don't press me why I didn't arrange all this. I don't know. It's just the way it is. So he keeps on sowing. Now the story says this sower keeps on sowing. Now the seed falls on shallow ground, rocky ground where the soil is shallow. And it says the little plant starts to grow. This time the birds didn't get it. But the first hot day, these little plants wither and die. Now that's kind of disappointing, isn't it? But see, that's bound to happen. This time you recruit John. John says, I'll be one of your best. He doesn't show up at the third meeting. You say, where's John? Say, I don't know. Somebody said, boo, and he <laughs> 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 
When I went to high school, there were uh, 400 and some in the, no, yes, there were 400 and some in the freshman class and 150 in the graduating class. Is that unusual? See, there's always more freshmen than seniors. What's that called? The law of averages. Life takes its inevitable toll. Everybody should stay and finish, right? Maybe they should, but they don't. And you've got to learn to take that into stride. See, otherwise you'll be bent out of shape, you'll be tipped over, you'll be frustrated, you will misread life, and you won't know what's happening. You've just got to understand, sometimes the seed falls on shallow ground. And it didn't say what to do about the shallow ground. It just said, that's the way it is. And we have a tendency to say, I thought sure John had last a month. But sure enough, it's happened. Now you're gonna be disappointed. Let me put this in here. When this doesn't work out, you know, just as you've planned, you're gonna be disappointed. But here's what you must learn to do as a leader. Learn to discipline your disappointment. That's very important. Because sometimes it's easy to say, well, Pete, he's quit, John, he's quit, I guess I'll quit. And you just follow instead of lead. You're gonna be disappointed, so be disappointed, but don't let it kill you. And don't let it stack up. Just understand, that's the way it is. I wish he would have stayed, but I wish him the best wherever he's gone. He didn't last, but so what? That's life. Now then, here's what it said the wise sower did. He kept on sowing. How clever. Now it says the seed falls on thorny ground. The guy says, well, how much of this trouble can you have? Well, hang on, it's not the end of the story. <laughs> says, now the seed falls on thorny ground and the little plant starts to grow, but then the thorns choke it to death. Now, is that fairly typical? See, the thorns are gonna get some. The little Bible story called the thorns, the cares of life, little cares, little duties that cheat people out of big opportunities. And it happens every day. And I don't know what to do about it. I call John up and I say, John, where were you last night? We had a meeting. John says, well, I can't make every meeting. I say, why not? John says, well, I got a lot of other things I got to do. I say, what are they? You won't believe the list John gave me for last night. The backyard fence was sagging and the dogs are about to get out. You just can't let your dogs run loose. The screen door had come off the hinges. You, you just can't let things fall apart. You got to take time and keep things fixed up. Some extra trash had piled up in the garage. You just can't let mountains of trash take over. You got to take time and haul out this stuff. On the phone, I can hear the thorns getting you. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> people letting little things cheat them out of big opportunities. Some people have the incredible ability to major in minor things. I drive through this little community. John's out there mowing his lawn, cussing the weeds, his face is red, and he's about to explode. I stop and I get out of the car. I say, John, what are you doing? He says, what does it look like? I'm doing a mowing this lousy lawn. I say, John, there's all kinds of little neighborhood boys around here. Mow your lawn. He says, well, they want $5, I'll mort myself, I'll mort myself. <laughs> Number one, there should be a law against cheating some little neighborhood boy out of $5. <laughs> that should be a law. But see, the biggest cheat is letting little things cheat you out of major opportunities called the thorns, the cares. But now what do you do about that? Well, see, I used to give classes on how not to let the thorns see, but that won't work. I mean, those classes won't help. Here's what it said this wise man did. He kept on sowing. How clever. He understood the law of averages. Keep sowing. Good people are not trained, they're found. 
You don't need much training, right, with good people. Find good people. Now, it says, finally, the seed falls on good ground. That's what it says, good. Somebody says, how do you find the good ground? Answer, keep looking. You'll recognize it when it comes by. You won't have to make something bad into something good. You'll recognize good when it comes by. Now, even the good ground, the story says, part of the good ground produced 30%, part of it produced 60%, and part of it produced 100%. Even the good ground. What's that called? The law of averages. The ratios. Where do they work? Everywhere. Who for? Everybody. Now, what you must do is understand the ratios as a leader so that you learn how to work with them and not against them. Now, see, I used to give classes here on how to do 100%, but see, that won't help. It's called frustration for the leader. Right? In the evening seminar, I say, right? The key to management is don't send your ducks to Eagle School, right? <laughs> and this is part of it here, right? It's learning where, what to do, and how to find the right people. What to do and how to find the right people. See, that's major. So, you let people who want to produce 30. They make a contribution to the whole and the 60 and the 100. Now, here's the key question. How do you find the 100 percenters? Answer, you got to go through the birds. You got to go through the hot weather getting some. You got to go through the shallow, rocky soil. You got to talk to the 30 people, the 60 people, to find you the hundreds. Here's what we say. If you want a lot of seniors, you must load the freshman class. <laughs> okay, that's how you find seniors. You just load the freshman class. And there's a lot of things, you just watch the process. You don't try to change the process. You just share the story and watch what happens. Share the opportunity and watch. And you pick by watching what happens. You don't force, you don't make, and you don't change, you watch. So it's called act and share and watch and pick. Okay, Act and share and watch and pick. And what's smart is to pick 100 percenters that become 100 percenters, right? You look like a hero. And you don't try to make 100 percenters out of people who are not going to do very much. And see, that's not on them. Now, some people in one enterprise are gonna do much better, you know, in one enterprise than they are in another. But whatever enterprise you've got going or whatever you're working with in the way of people, just understand the law of averages. And here's the key, don't try to change it. Learn to work with it. Okay, is that helpful? The law of averages. I'm telling you, it'll save you a lot of heartache. It'll save you a lot of mistakes and a lot of errors and a lot of wondering and a lot of pondering, sleepless nights, agony. I mean, it just cures a whole lot of things once you understand the law of averages. Okay. Topic under leadership, how to build a successful team of people. Finding, finding the right people is always a unique challenge. But that's where success comes from, the team effort. If you're gonna put any kind of enterprise together that has a specific objective, being a national championship team or a, a business, an enterprise, a, a church, an organization, you've just got to find the right people. And this is how to build a successful team of people to accomplish a specific purpose. Now, if you don't have a specific purpose, then you can probably just use most anybody. But if you've got a, a purpose, you know, whether it's a sales purpose or an office purpose or a real estate purpose or a church purpose or a, 
organization purpose or a championship team, right? If you're going to build an organization of people for a specific accomplishment, then you've got to have uh, the right people. And let me just give you a little checklist we use around the world trying to find the right people. First, there's a checklist of three things. First, you check interest. And checking a person's interest, uh, there's probably several ways you can do it. One is, I guess, by resume. What someone has done in the past may indicate their interest for the future. But I, the best way really to check interest is face to face. You know, you just got to look at somebody and have them look back and get into conversation and talk about the enterprise and talk about, you know, the job description, you know, what it's all about to find a person's true interest. Now, in the role of leadership, you do have to be cautioned that some people are going to try to fake you out. So you've got to get ready for that. But um, if you do it often enough, person to person, face to face, you can get good at really checking a person's true interest. I guess Jesus' master teacher was the best at it. The story says one day a group came to him and said, uh, Master, we wish to be your disciples. Jesus said, gentlemen, you have put your story on the wrong person. Because unfortunately, I can read your heart. They said, oh. <laughs> See, they weren't wanting to be disciples. They had, all, they had all kinds of trickery in mind, but that was the upfront show of interest. We wish to be your disciples. But see, he read them just right off the bat. Now, you might not get that good at it, <laughs> right, to where you can read hearts. But I'll tell you what, though, if you will practice, if you'll be sensitive, if you'll look, if you won't miss anything, you can get very good at reading true interest to really check that against what you hear in the conversation that's going on. Now, of course, here's where the woman comes in with her extra special <laughs> gifts, right? See, if a man's having problems recruiting someone or, or talking to another man and he's not quite sure, then he just lets a woman sit in on the conversation and says, you just sit and listen while I talk to this gentleman and then you'd give me your feelings. And sure enough, you know, she'll tell you. You know, when it's over, you just consult with her. Say, how'd you feel? She'll say, hey. I felt great. Or she will say, I don't think so, right? Because the women have this uncanny sense of danger or something doesn't ring a bell. But, uh, you know, men can get good at it. But anybody who practices this art of really trying to judge true interest can get better and better at it. Now, no matter how good you get, you're still going to make some errors in judgment. Jesus said, I'll take you. And that was Judas. I mean, so you are going to make, you know, some errors. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So that helps me, right, to know when I make some errors. Now, so first of all, you check interest. Here's the second thing you check is response. A person might be interested in the pay, or they might be interested in, uh, you know, the opportunity or the future, but you also have to check response. How they respond to the job description. Are they excited and eager about whatever it takes to do it to get the job done? If somebody says, you have to get there how early? You have to stay how late? Go home in the middle of the traffic? The brakes only, what was that again? 10 minutes? <laughs> you just have to say next, right? You, you just don't have the right person because the response is wrong. Then third, third 
thing you check to build a successful team of people is results. And I don't know any substitute for that. Finally, you must judge by results. Results must soon match quality. You might have a nice person, a good person, but unless you start getting early results, then you just don't have the right person. And it isn't that the wrong person may be a bad person, it's just that they are not the right person for the job, for the skill, for whatever needs to be accomplished. You know, the great coach John Wooden I'm sure said to the supposedly skilled young basketball player, he says, sir, can you hit it from the corner? I got to have me a corner man who can hit it from the corner. And uh, well, how are we going to know if you can hit it from the corner? Right? John says, well, I'll just stand here and you just fire away and I'll count. <laughs> That's how you finally tell. Just launch a few, and I'll just, I'll just keep score here, because I got to have somebody who can win the corner. Now, finally, you got to judge by results, and the early part of activity doesn't need to be the final results. The results can be, did you make the calls? This job calls for at least 10 calls a day. So the next morning, we get the little sheet out, and I say, John, how many calls on that 10 did you make yesterday? John says, well, say, the well won't even fit in the box. <laughs> and sure enough, I've got this indication, John's gonna come up with a story, and the story for sure won't fit in the box. I say, John, the box is too small for the story. All I need is a number. One, three, five, eight, seven, just give me the number and I'll put it in the box. See, finally, you must judge by results. Because that's the name of the game, right? Results. Now, we all need to give people time for results, but finally, you must judge by results. We don't judge by stories. We just let the numbers speak for themselves. We like the activity that we've set up. Now make sure when you recruit somebody, put somebody on and you're developing an organization, whatever you're doing, make sure everybody understands up front 